Hi, this is Dr. Habib again. Today I want to talk a little bit about dementia. There's a big uh, field and lots of data coming strong, so I want to try to keep it a little bit simple if I may. So the terminology that people are using now, and I think appropriately, is that dementia is like type 3 diabetes. So let's reiterate what type 2 diabetes is. We, we assume it's a mature onset diabetes. In other words, as you get older, the pancreas doesn't produce as much insulin and sugar starts to rise. And then, you know, the sugar has to be over 125 fasting to call it diabetes. And uh, I personally think you can diagnose insulin resistance and prediabetes a decade in advance, which is the right way to do it, frankly. But let's just go with the current standards, which is diabetes type 2 is when the bl fasting blood sugar is over 125 and that the amount of insulin being released from the pancreas is uh, not adequate to keep the sugar below. So what is type 3 diabetes? Uh, so it's just terminology. There is no lab data to measure sugar in the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, and there's no such thing. But what we do know is that um, all the common complications uh, or, uh, that we deal with when it comes to diabetes and sugar management seem to be the same risk factors for dementia. In other words, the people who are prone to diabetes are going to have more dementia. And uh, there are certain genetics like APOE. APOE is a case where people don't make ketones. They readily produce more sugar, and those APOE people tend to get more dementia at a very premature age. So if you're 100 years old and you get dementia, that's not so premature. 90 years old, no one's going to fault you for you know, uh, having a memory that's not optimal. And you know, of course, with age, you do get a decrease in brain function, namely memory. That's because inside the neurons, there are tangles and there's uh, you know, things which are just interfering, but not so much. But dementia is where it goes beyond that. And beyond the tangles and things interfering, you now have deposits of proteins called amyloid. Those are indication that some kind of in injury has taken place and the amyloid has been deposited. And if you have too much of that being deposited where neurons should be, it's going to definitely interfere with the neurological uh, neuron connectivity. And so memory and even processing would be impacted. So, so what do we mean by diabetes type 3? Okay, interesting. So let me give you an analogy and, uh, and see if, uh, I, I, you know, it's not just diabetes type 3 because that helps people understand there's a connection, but I'm going to give you the science uh, between the connection. So if you have two diabetics with identical blood sugars, di identical hemoglobin A1C, so just say same gender, same age, no other risk factors. One is going to get a heart attack, one is not, because, you know, we know that no matter how well you control a diabetic, there's twice as many heart attacks in diabetics than the normal population. But the question really is, how can we figure out which of the two diabetics are going to get the heart attack? And that's the, the similarity, that uh, the connection between type 2 diabetes and, and, and so-called type 3 or dementia. The connection is this. The diabetic that has inflammation is the one that's going to get the heart attack. Not all diabetics are going to have the same amount of inflammation. And and it's not a maybe. Maybe it's not type, diabetes type 3. Maybe it's inflammation. And that's uh, actually more accurate. Uh, because once you have inflammation in the brain, then the nerves have mechanisms to repair through glial cells. And the mechanism to repair that inflammation results in destruction of the neuron. And as a result, in, uh, after the destruction of the neuron, you deposit amyloid. We call them plaques, certain tau cells. But really, the prerequisite was inflammation. So that's what's common between diabetes and uh, type 2 and diabetes type 3. I suppose what people are saying uh, why it's uh, diabetes type 2 and 3 is probably because what's also common is probably insulin resistance. Insulin resistance just means that for the same amount of sugar, you have to make more insulin to control it because there's resistance to the function of that insulin. And uh, that's the prerequisite to diabetes. So without diabetes, if you have insulin resistance, you're more likely to develop diabetes uh, because you'll be churning out more and more insulin and then you'll be depleted. And when you get to about 30, 40% uh, reserve, that's when the sugar starts to go up. The insulin can't match. 
um, the requirement to keep the sugar down. So insulin resistance is probably the connection between the two. But what is insulin resistance? Insulin resistance is a phenomena that is linked very close to the microbes in the gut. Because the microbes in the gut are responsible for inflammation. And inflammation and insulin resistance are almost synonymous. And this complex intertwine, uh, interconnection is between the gut and the liver. So insulin sensitivity is not just about the pancreas not being sensitive to insulin. Insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance can happen at the pancreas level, at the gut level, at the adipose, the fat tissue level, at the muscle level, at the liver level. And it's an immunological problem, really, because, because by the time you have high insulin levels and by the time you have high sugar levels, that's way down the, the, down the process. And at that, insulin resistance is synonymous with type 2 diabetes and probably type 3 diabetes. But insulin resistance tends to happen more in an environment where there's inflammation. So you have a bad diet, you eat refined foods, you don't sleep, you're under stress, you have a leaky gut, you have poor bacterial flora, you have acid reflux, you know, uh, irritable bowel syndromes, chronic pro gastrointestinal problems. And so, so instead of just calling it type 3 diabetes, which I think is a good first uh, attempt because it gets people's attention. And probably the most important aspect is to say, you know, if we can reverse diabetes, we can reverse dementia too. And controlling diabetes is not what I'm talking about, because if you try to control dementia, you're on a losing battle. And if you control diabetes, it never prevented heart attacks until we started with a class of medicine for insulin resistance. So the data shows when people start on medicines, which we call GLP receptor agonists, they're namely um, Bidurion and um, Trulicity and so forth, they actually showed a decline in the incidence of heart attacks in diabetics. Now, that's talking about getting to the root of the problem, right? And um, just controlling the sugar never seemed to prevent heart attack until we address insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is not just for the diabetes diabetic. Insulin resistance is probably at the root of dementia as well because insulin resistance only takes place when there's inflammation. And inflammation is taking place because of, as we said, the bad lifestyle. And so hopefully that's useful in uh, discussing, you know, diabetes type 2 and the so-called diabetes type, the so-called diabetes type 3. There's no such thing as diabetes type 3. This is what's being postulated. I think it's reasonable to go down that route. Just like with diabetes and its complications, you know, d dementia and its complications, there's underlying inflammation is the problem and underlying oxidation and immune dysregulation. So the reason I threw those two other terminologies is because they are sort of interconnected. It, it's very, it would be very nice to start with step one, step two, step three, uh, but it doesn't work that way because sometimes people have uh, oxidation but no inflammation. Sometimes they have inflammation but no oxidation. So it, there is no smoking gun. There is no black and white. It goes back to my art of medicine, which is that, look, all the data is good, but they're just data points. And the more data points you have, you can make better judgment. More data, better judgment. But at the end of the day, it's the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And there, that takes data points, that takes life experiences, that takes the practice of medicine. There's a whole host of things going on. And, and so I want people to understand that, that conveyor belt medicine of just treating the cholesterol is merely controlling and didn't fix the problem. Controlling the blood sugar wasn't the solution to prevent a heart attack. It was actually turning off insulin resistance, which is synonymous with inflammation. And that merely controlling blood pressure is not good because we don't do it very well. Only half the people are controlled. And it may be that we're having a tough time because, number one, patients aren't probably taking the medication the way they're supposed to. Number two, they're not you know, changing their lifestyle like they should. Uh, so the, all the fault is not with the doctor. But really, maybe we're not turning off oxidation, and that's why not only is the blood pressure not able to be better controlled, but we're also getting certain number of people that end up with strokes. So uh, to finish on a, a note about blood pressure is that, look, blood pressure is not the end all or be all of all damage, but the softness of the blood vessels will determine whether you get a problem or not. Because a stiff blood vessel is synonymous with stroke. A soft blood vessel, I postulate, is less. Again, we can't say 100% because you have to do a study to be able to say 100%. But blood pressure alone is not the problem. Blood pressure with stiff blood vessels is the problem. 
And the fact is, we just assume that if you have blood pressure out for decades and decades, you're supposed to have a stiffer blood vessel, but not so fast. If you take enough omega-3 and you take enough vitamin D and you have enough antioxidants and you exercise and you go to sleep on time, even if you have raised blood pressure, remember the way I said it, raised blood pressure, even if it's hypertension, but if you look at augmentation, which is a different technological way to look at it, which is, a, a, in other words, high augmentation means stiff blood vessels, more likely to get the stroke. Uh, low augmentation, soft blood vessels, less likely. Again, this will be evidence-based once somebody does the studies, but you can take my word for it. Aim for soft blood vessels because some people just genetically have a strong drive to get the blood pressure, but you can still keep the blood vessels soft because I have evidence that you can do that. And for people who don't have genetic predisposition, you created it because you didn't sleep enough. You created it because you have too much salt in the diet. You created it because you have a bad diet. You created it because you didn't exercise, right? So for those people, it should be actually easier. Just go ahead and make slight changes in all the different aspects of your lifestyle. And, and again, there are people that may not have high blood pressure, but the blood vessels are stiff. How do you get stiff blood vessels? Oxidation. So, uh, people like myself will look for oxidation. We'll try to measure oxidation. We'll try to measure nitric oxide or its surrogates. And we have to look at everything together. We look at the blood pressure, we look at the augmentation, we look at identifying risks for oxidation, inflammation. You want to look at how the gut's functioning. You have to look at how the hormones are, the thyroid hormone, the endocrine glands like uh, the pancreas, but even hormones like testosterone are really, really important in making your body function right. So. Uh, I want to stop there because it now is bringing too many things into it. But unfortunately, that's how you're supposed to practice medicine. But in order to explain it all, I think too much information might be a little uh, detrimental at this stage. So I just want you to, um, uh, just wanted to summarize that, um, that, um, that, uh, that it's the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And in order to achieve that, your doctor should have lots of data points, should really get to know you, and have lots of, the doctor should have lots of life experiences. And the most important life experience, the doctor had better live his medicine. If he's stuck on his medicines, you can't expect a better answer from that doctor. If he couldn't fix his blood pressure, diabetes, he or she didn't fix his blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol, then maybe he doesn't have the tools to help you. And what should be frightening is that you can control all the risk factors for heart disease and you can only reduce the risk of heart attack by 25%. And frankly, diabetics were getting twice as many heart attacks as the regular population, even when we control the sugar, until we address insulin resistance. Now, that's just one medicine. That won't be enough because insulin resistance is not uh, it's a, a monolith. It's a reflection of multiple factors going on. Hope that was useful.